Good evening, everybody. I'm Patricia Camilleri, president of the Archaeological Society Malta. The ASM and the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Malta are, as always, delighted to uh, see you all again. Welcome to our dedicated followers and also to those who are joining for the first time. All lectures this because this season will be a collaboration between the Department of Classics and Archaeology, University of Malta and the Archaeological Society Malta. And thanks go, as always, to the head of department, Dr. John Siegbetz, and to Professor Nicholas Bella, ASM Vice President. Mr. Joshua de Giorgio will be delivering this evening's lecture, which is entitled Searching for Social Values, People-Centred Heritage, in Malta's historic places. Just a quick word before we start about how the evening will proceed. I'll be introducing Joshua de Giorgio, then turning the virtual floor over to him. Please do ask questions using the chat, which you will kind of access at the bottom of, or the top of your screen anytime during the talk. At the end, I shall ask Joshua to answer at least some of those queries as time allows. You are kindly asked to mute yourselves during the talk. Use of your video, of course, is optional. I would like to inform you that this talk is being recorded and will be available on our website in a few days' time. So let's move on to a very brief bio of Joshua de Giorgio. He is a third year PhD candidate in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York supported by a, a doctoral studentship through the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities in the UK and the Tertiary Education Scholarship Scheme here in Malta. Joshua read for a BA in History and Anthropology at Luther College USA in 1999 and followed this with an MA in Historical Archaeology at the University of York in 2001. After a hiatus of about 20 years, he returned to his studies to read for a master's in, master's in cultural heritage management in 2019, once again at the University of York. Joshua's primary research interests are the heritage of the contemporary world, heritage communities, and social values. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Joshua. Thank you very much. Can uh, I hope I'm still quite clear. I'm going to share my screen and get this going. Okay, does that look okay? Right, thank you very much, um, uh, Trish, for your kind invitation. So I, I, I'd like to thank both Prof. Vella for badgering me into doing this and uh, Trisha for her patience with helping set it up. Um, Again, I'd like to acknowledge my funders because I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for them. So thank you to Rock and Tess who have supported this three year um, stint of academic tourism as I like to call it. Um, uh, I would also like to thank the society from another perspective. This lecture is, is, um, is satisfying one of my funding requirements which is something called the KEP, which is a knowledge exchange program. And that is the, the idea behind that is that you're being funded and then at the end of your funding period, you return something to a community that may benefit from. And I don't think I would have got back into archaeology if it wasn't for the archaeological site, because I started attending the lectures and it's true that, that I sort of made the plunge to go back into again. So thank you very much. It's kind of coming full circle. Well, enough with the pleasantries. I guess we should get going. So quick have a look at the um, how I've structured this, this um, lecture. Um, I'm just assuming that this is a sort of introductory um, lecture on, you know, some, some people may not be familiar with some of these key concepts, so I'm introducing a few of the key concepts from the world of um, heritage studies and heritage practice. Um, the lecture will focus in on my particular interest in social values and communities and how individuals attribute significance to places and things. Um, Value-based systems are not new. Uh, they are they are the, the, the foundational, you know, sort of driving force behind a lot of heritage practice. Think, uh, you know, um, 
heritage assessments, impact assessments, scheduling, listing, they all have at their core some sort of value assessment of what on heritage aspects. I will follow the introduction of these ideas with two case studies. They are related in a sense because the Tinier case study is was the focus of my um, MA and Valletta is my current um, focus. And that's one of the reasons why I chose this image because it's during my PhD studies and you've got Tinier in the background. Um, I'm then hoping that we'll have some time at the end to have some time for, for Q&A for this and discussion. A little bit of a research statement. This is kind of a who I am positionality type statement. I'm late coming to this game. I have never worked in heritage and I'm not a professional in any capacity. My experience is mostly academic and I guess I'm an observer, but the occasional participant when I can. I just hope that um, I am, you know, I'm also a resident of a letter, which is one of my major case studies. Um, and so these questions come from a, a personal level as well as an academic level. I just hope that some of the themes that I will be presenting today pique your interests or are complementary to how you understand or work with heritage in many of its incarnations. So just starting at the beginning, um, the reason why I'm doing this is just to give you some sort of sense, some sort of context as to where heritage values come from. And so we're going to give a little whistle stop tour of some of what I think are the key ideas and some of the key changes, because that is my work comes out of that. Heritage, of course, doesn't have a time frame as such. You know, if you think about it, all elements on, on the long timeline of archaeology or ethnography are somebody's heritage at some stage. But heritage and pra the practice of, of sort of heritage studies, as we understand it, I would say, I would argue, are, comes from sort of the 18th and 19th centuries. Heritage is very much entwined with that sort of nation building experience of the period. The famous um, uh, historian Hobsbawm describes this as an invented tradition and argues that these heritage bound constructs were created to promote social cohesion, legitimize social structures and institutions and cement relationships of authority. I just think that's a rather quite a nice quote from Hobsbawm. But it, it, it helps you understand why maybe in this period you start getting this heritage documentation. Two of the famous ones, well, one of the famous ones in the UK at least is obviously the Ancient Monuments Protections Act, the act of listing, of making these lists of what is important, and they are generally always monuments. Um, locally, we have the Antiquities Protection Act in 1925. I believe there's an earlier one, but this one is the one that's most similar in terms of making lists. And it is in the sort of the same period that the kind of the first classification of, of, mon of these monuments, and it generally always feeds back into to Regal's cult of monuments from 1903. And this is a classification system, one that we would recognize today, one where, you know, values of heritage were given, these are neat categories. But going forwards, and the reason why I look at these documents is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of these documents inform agencies and institutions or have done in over the years and continue to do so, and they change over time. Some of the key ones in the, or a foundation from the canon of heritage studies would be these three. I've cho there are more, of course, but I've chosen these three because they kind of illustrate my point. Um, I, I term this as the heritage of vulnerability. It was a particular period where, where there was a, you know, a concern with the preservation, the conservation of historic centers. And the, some of the, the, these are three of the most um, important guiding documents that, that, that have uh, from this period. The Athens Charter is very much of that sort of heritage of vulnerability period. It's interwar. It's it's uh, you know it's 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 a blueprint for the development and planning of cities, but it does focus in on what heritage or sorry historic um, centers may what role they have in this sort of process of developing these cities, um, amongst other things, of course. The Venice Charter is uh, is from the post-war period, but it's 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 quite interesting and it formalizes best, best practice. This is when heritage practices became quite professionalized. It sets down sets down you know um, the guidelines, the best practices, what is required to be able to you know ethically do this work. It also as an interesting it does have it does foreground the historic value of heritage, but at the same time, quite interestingly. It, recognizes that modest monuments and buildings can be just as important as long as they have a historic link. But that's still a change. In the Maltese context, I guess UNESCO is probably, the World Heritage Convention is probably the one we're most familiar with. Um, this emerges from the same milieu, I guess. It, it is concerned with this sort of, the, that these very important sites are being damaged and they need to be protected. But it's, and it introduces 
this new notion that places can be outstanding, that they have universal value, that this is a sort of global heritage. In the in the world of heritage designation, these are the top trumps. You know, this is um, this is the big one. But the key element in that discussion is that this is still very much the heritage of the monument. It is very much concerned with the grand, the important, um, the ones that very often are used to underpin na notions of um, nationhood uh, or symbols of power, that sort of thing. This is not a particular critique, but um, I just want to emphasize that there is a, a timeline that we develop out of that sort of fixation, if you, if you will. So um, there is a paradigm shift. Um, and this is, and I'm just going to have a quick look at some, this is probably the wordiest slide, so bear with me. But it is important because this is sort of what underpins my own work. Um, I guess I would call it a distillation of the framework I myself use. Of these new conventions and charters, I would say that the, the Borough Charter from 1979 with later revisions, which is why I have those dates there, um, is probably the most influential. Uh, it's a it's contemporary with the emergence of a post-colonial critique that emerged in the late 70s and 80s and even up to the 90s where archaeologists like Trigger and later Byrne warned that the practice of archaeology in certain contexts uh, could reinforce colonial narratives by imposing Western worldview on indigenous ones. That's from the world of archaeology in particular context but what the Borough Charter did to address that is to introduce new definitions and to expand old ones. So we moved from a monument to the idea of places of cultural significance, and that's a much broader category. It's much more inclusive. It also, also, and I'm gonna quote directly from it, places may have a range of values for different individuals or groups that suggests that a place doesn't have a single inherent value that is not only universal. Other people may have values, value a place for different reasons. And that should be something that should be celebrated as part of the significance of a place. There are, of course, a lot of other ones. The UNESCO Intangible Heritage um, uh, Convention on Intangible Heritage added the process of, you know, culture, activity, tradition, folklore. Again, opening up the definition of what's heritage. It wasn't simply about the monument. One that I'm particularly keen on is on the, on the Faro Convention, which is from 2004 which <clears throat> follows in the footsteps of Barra, but it innovates by placing an express emphasis on the human right of public participation in, this, in all processes um, related to heritage. So, and also what it does is it recognizes the idea of heritage communities, which, which are people with a shared interest, uh, which is something which I have done a lot of work with. There are lots of other examples. The European Landscape Convention is a very important one, which is a sort of holistic, um, management tool that includes the historic landscape, but also importantly, promotes the idea of social well-being, that heritage can provide a sort of sense of social be well-being. There's the Historic Urban Landscape from 2012, which is yet another, which is a recommendation, which is an interesting one, and also talks about livability of historic spaces and planning. Again, an important context in my work later for the case studies. Some themes now just from heritage theory or critical theory. So this is sort of the academic understanding of theory. If charters like the borough wanted to broaden definitions of heritage in response to really what I think are legitimate concerns over inclusivity, um, some aspects of critical heritage have been more forthright in their critique, of both heritage management and practice. One of the themes, one of the main instruments that has been pointed out or postulated is this authorized heritage discourse, which is, which is how Professor Laura Jane Smith termed the instruments that she identifies um, maintain the power imbalance between the practitioner and the heritage consumer. This, Smith argued that this resulted in a, a, a discourse which favors the grand and important, the historical, the aesthetically pleasing, while simultaneously fixing authority to make decisions as to what was important in the hands of the practitioner. In short, she was questioning, you know, the hegemonic roles of, of, these, of these institutions. Now, you may agree or disagree with this, and there's been a lot of rebuttals to this, but I think that the self-conscious, um, this approach, which is more self-conscious, which is more positive, is a positive trait. It is not a question that of eliminating expertise. I would have very few job prospects if I followed that line of thinking but rather of recognizing that as, as my supervisor, and I'm hoping for brownie points here, has noted, in some small way, um, everybody is a heritage expert. 
what this does though, and what this sort of uh, approach does is it just gives voice to local knowledge and champions that, which I think is an important thing, especially when dealing with communities. Um, so I think that's an important, what, what, this, what this adds to the conversation is that um, if we want public participation in heritage to thrive, community projects and public engagement um, are important things to pursue. Uh, this sort of th thinking and sort of example, I, I can think of like public archaeology as, as a growing um, established field nowadays. Uh, I think Dr. Green actually noted that in some ways all archaeology could be public archaeology. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. But in brief, just to end, end the theory stuff, I would just say that this new group of paradigms broaden the, broadens the category of the stuff of heritage, what we consider heritage. It champions heritage value beyond the traditional elite or Western notion. It makes space for the local and for the ordinary. And I think it emphasizes public engagement and participation in the process of heritage. So, quick aside, it's also about the stuff of heritage. And as Palmer notes in the um, Heritage and Beyond from 2009, heritage is not simply about the past. It is vitally about the present and the future. A heritage that is disjoined from ongoing life has limited value. And I think that's a, that's a fun way of just thinking about that, that the heritage of contemporary world allows us to make that connection. And this, I call this the heritage of the everyday. It's a term that has been used. And it just means that we just the ordinary, the mundane things that are not necessarily grand. And the argument would be that something as beautiful and evocative as Castile could be just as interesting as rising some bar to some people. I could have probably spared you having to sit through that by just using the picture of the iceberg of heritage, which I have here on the right from Kay, from Kay Clark's book, where you have world heritage and all the other big important things on top and all the other things that are interesting at the bottom. Anyhow, again, this is about value typologies. And just like there are, I consider there to be many, many types of value, values that people attribute to places, there are lots of different value typologies. I'm not going to go into them. They're not particularly interesting, but there is, um, there is, these have developed over time. And you can see Regal's original ones, Lips, the Borough Charters, English Heritage's ones from 97. And I will end this section by just using a very, just defining what I mean by social value. And I'm not defining this. I'm using um, Conservation Principles 2008 definition because I really think it covers all the bases. And you can see how this links back to, to all the discussions that have happened and all the new themes that have come up um, in, in, the in the documents and charters I, I listed earlier. That social value is associated with places that people perceive as a sort of identity, distinctiveness, social interaction, and coherence can be comparatively modest, it acquires communal significance through the passage of time, and that it may have no direct relationship to any formal or historical or aesthetic values that may be ascribed to it. So with that in mind, I'm gonna take you to the first of my case studies. And um, this, let me just find my place in my notes. Um, this is, this is uh, based around the fort of Tignier. Now, this was, the, this was the, the, the subject of my MA. And the subject of my MA specifically was the fort. But I really like this image because this is a tinier as we've, we've never experienced it. And it's from the late 19th century, I do believe. And you can see the sort of military architecture landscape, which is quite familiar in, in Malta, it used to be. Um, all that remains of this is the fort itself. Some of the barrack buildings elements have been incorporated into the, um, the new development. And the officer's mess, which is this sort of cake-like structure over here, which became the Holiday Inn at some point in its history. Now, why choose Tignier? And there is a reason. That is what Tignier looks like today. It's a very different proposition. Um, the fort just sits there. It is fully restored, has been for 10 years, yet is inaccessible. People can't, it is not open to the public. It's almost like a giant garden folly for, for the luxury apartments that we see above it. Um, but at the same time, it has been restored. It is a, a beautiful historical object. It's very much a traditional example of the sort of architectural, historic um, heritage um, monument that, that is that sort of traditional thing we were talking about, uh, looking after and conserving. It was built by the Knights at the end of the 18th century. It was remodeled many, many times. You can see some of the later remodeling uh, um, that the British did in the 1930s. 
And it was abandoned in the late 1970s. And that's where I pick up the story because the bit of the, the history that I'm actually interested in is a brief slice of time between 1979 and 1991. And it's about a community that was based there. And that community now only exists on Facebook. And that's how I came across it. And there's a picture from their Facebook group there. It's a, quite a big group. There's about 2,500 members. Um, and it, it it was I wanted to I wanted to see what this meant to them. So I just thought it would be a perfect example of looking at a contemporary heritage um, community because they are a heritage community. This is forty odd years ago, and what their experiences and what they valued about the about the fort and what it was what was significant about it. The picture to your right is the fort prior to restoration. The cleanup had already started, but that's that is the fort as most people will remember it. And the central keep was a bar called Tori Bar, which you can see with the biking, the biker, the biker club using, and that's probably from like late 1991. Now, what actually happened to the fort in, 1990, in 1979 is that a, a guy called Eric El Punk moved in with his band Abstras because he realized that these concrete rooms would be perfect for band practice. It was private, it was secure, and he basically squatted there. But more and more bands started coming because it was a free place to, to rehearse. And um, eventually it got sanctioned. It became the AST, which was a sort of official, you could, you could rent the rooms from the local, lo local authorities. And it wasn't just music bands that were based there. There, was, um, there, were, there were clubs, hobby clubs. There was even a theatre group, which had a, quite a big impact on Maltese popular culture in the early to mid 80s. Our theatre was based in one of the corners here, I don't know if you can see my mouth pointer, but it was based here. That's where that's where they practice and sort of practice their plays. So there was this sort of performative community existing for ten years in this in this space. Um, it's not unusual that heritage and music follow each other. There's a lot of literature. There's been a lot of um, literature concerning heritage of music, musical history, popular culture. A uh, prime example of this would be Liverpool, uh, a, a city that bases a lot of its sort of exportable heritage on its attachment to the Beatles and, you know, the Mersey sound. Um, but there are other towns, there's, there's Berlin um, and, and Techno Sea. There's, there's many of these examples. So it's an interesting, I found this was an interesting example of being able to chase that up and see how that might fit with some of these ideas of looking for social value. So what I was interested in particularly were these groups, and that was the main thing. So these are some photos that, that were shared with me or I got from Facebook. It was a community of bands. Um, uh, it, was, it was interesting. This was, these, these were young Maltese people. from. A, uh, that were, it was not a homogenous group. These weren't just kids from Slima. They came from all over the place. They came from, from, from across the water in Valletta, from the three cities. Um, they were different. They were different ages. They were sonically diverse. And I just wondered, what, how did it work? What was happening? How did they use the space? What was fortunate is that they're actually quite proud of this community and they have huge archives. So I was able to, to meet with them and share in their archives. And the archives span things from posters to um, cassettes to documentation of meetings they used to have. The scene itself actually spawned. The, there was a there was a sort of teen magazine called Far Out in Malta in the 80s, and this was made by people who were part of that teeny scene. It was it was like a vehicle for for the scene itself. So, how did I go about trying to capture this and understand what was happening? So I did two basic things. I used memory mapping, and I did interviews. Excuse me. The memory mapping. What I did was I. I wanted to see if, you know, you know, I wanted to spatialize these memories. So what I did was I got a, I got a, I blew up a, every time I took an, I did an interview, I would take an A3 um, sheet with me with what the teeny peninsula looked like in the 60s, because there's the OS map available. And as we were talking, I'd ask them to highlight places or tell me some stories or whatever it was that was meaningful. And they would just doodle on, on the sheets. As you can see in the example inside here, the, the informant is, is, you know, marking some spots, but he's also telling me how they walked into the place, what they talked about on the way, where they would stop, that sort of thing. They also, also, there were a lot of interviews down where they share lots of photographs with me. This is, you know, clearly a really important place for these, for this group of people. After I'd done the analysis, and I need to, I need to not go this into this in too much detail, the, um, 
principal theme that came out was that it was in belonging to a community that was central to them. And it was that is the that that is it is that social interaction, that sense of cohesion, referring back to that definition of social value I, I put up on the board earlier. It's in belonging, in, in drawing some sort of sense of identity. So even if they were different people, this sort of teen year sense of identity was very, very important to them. Um, how this was manifest on the actual landscape, so what bits of which, which bits of the, the, the fort they found important, it was specifically bits that involved the bands and the performances. There was actually there were actually venues here. So if you look at some of these, I don't know if you can see them very clearly, but I'll tell you what I'm actually seeing here. There's a concert area which they all brought up. Now, I don't know if you remember Malta in the 80s, but not much happened. So them remembering that a foreign band like Nazareth would come and play, and they actually built a bespoke stage for them to play, which was there until the mid-90s. Um, it was basically concrete. But they would they would all mention that because that was a big part of, of the scene and of, of, of being able to see that way. They all mentioned their rooms. And so what these little notes are, are them trying to remember the interactions they had and which bands were in which rooms. And there's a quote at the bottom, which I think is quite poignant. Someone actually told me, said, the rooms were everything. That was the heritage. You take away the rooms and nothing is left. It is dead. That's how they felt about the changes. So in brief, some of the, some of the sort of values that came out of that. There's coherence and identity. I got to know what Tinier was through friends. In the earliest days, we were all into music, and that's what connected us. There was, no, there was very little politics, and that's strange in an era like the mid-80s, which was quite a turbulent time. Sense of place is a very big deal. They created a sense of place by being there, by interacting with the space, by graffitiing the whole of it. So this is this is actually a quote I really like, which is Tinier is not in Slim. It might as well have been in Timbuktu. It was so outlandish and so different to the, to the sort of sense of place you had in sort of just normal Slim and then you walk into Tinier. And there's also this sense of heritage disconnect. And we're talking about sort of a disenfranchisement here. I don't recognize the place anymore. I go there often. It makes me cry. I try and peep and see our room, but they're not accessible. It's horrible. Um, and this is a really, I really like this photo of, these, of, of the subverts in their rehearsal space where they spend so much time. So that, that, is, that I hope is, demonstrates at least that, you know, looking at social value of the contemporary past adds a little bit of, to this heritage puzzle, you know, especially when, when the groups themselves, their, their sort of sense of heritage has been disenfranchised. It has been literally restored away. Um, that takes me to the second case study, which is Valletta. Um, so how I, how I settled on Valletta was quite simple, really. I was asked if I would like to do a PhD, and I said, yes, well, that sounds like a good idea. Um, and then I was asked, okay, what are you going to do? And I said, well, what if I took some of the ideas from my May, so that these ideas of you know, heritage value and how they sometimes are in an unconventional place, or they come from unconventional uncon directions and are really tied to social value, and, and I applied them to something else, something bigger this time. And um, I said, yeah, what about Valletta? And I said, yeah, that, that's good. And that was the entirety of our conversation. I mean, I did have to do a little more work about that, of course, but it started from that. Um, so the goals we set out to do were pretty simple. What are the social values of residents and those who interact with the city? And how does this contribute to making Valletta a significant heritage place to them? Now, why Valletta? I mean, Valletta is a city that is rapidly changing. This is something we all know. It is the reality of the city in the last 15 years. I'm also a resident-ish. I mean, I've lived in England for four years, but my home is still there. So there's that personal connection. And there's also a familial connection. I've, I've used a, a slide from my great-grandfather's business in an abandoned building, which is at the top of Merchant Street. Also, I get the sense that a lot of the discussions were always about the built environment and worrying about the historic and aesthetic values. And this is very closely aligned to its World Heritage Stage, which is totally understandable. It's an important thing for the city to have. Also, Valletta is just the, the flashpoint for local debates on heritage issues. Um, and what I mean by that is every time something happens in Valletta, there's a huge hoo-ha. And so I found that a very interesting, um, interesting thing, because if you, there's, the city gate is one of the obvious ones, and this is a beautiful still from Bettina Hucek's movie about the knocking down of city gate. And of course, the, the Royal Opera House, which I think I have never seen more argumentation and discord on on social media that every time this is brought up and what should be done with it etc etc but reading these comments got me thinking okay 
there's a lot of concern about that. Is that the only thing that's important about the city? And of course, this exists in a much broader context of heritage peril that our country is in. I mean, I don't think a week goes by without us actually ever seeing a story in the news um, about something being endangered. It's quite common. I mean, these are slightly older ones. When you get to Valletta, there's a lot of worry about our UNESCO World Heritage status. Again, totally understandable. Um, uh, so I thought, okay, this is a this is a perfect place to actually try and apply these sort of these sort of new paradigm shift kind of ideas. Now, this is a bit of a recap because I've already talked about this, but this is this is the approach I took. I wanted it to be bottom-up versus top-down. I wanted it to be therefore people-centered. I wanted it not to come from um, the heritage pra practitioner's perspective. Um, because they, it's a complex relationship they have and it's a very difficult job that they do. I wanted to know what sort of every, every, the, the everyday sort of heritage that people are interested in. I wanted it to be more contemporary and critical. And by this, I don't mean it's more up to date in any way. What I do mean is that it's more in line with the kind of thinking that you we read about when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, you know, when you're trying to study and understand heritage. I really wanted it to focus on social values. Now, this does not mean I exclusively looked at social values. It means that I kind of modeled the methodology to make sure that I got that, I got that data. And I wanted it to be inclusive of everyday heritage. Um, so how do I do that? Now, um, I wanted to try something. When, and and this, this, the case study builds a lot from what I learned in, in, in my MA. One of the interviews I did towards the very end, and I end up not using it, was, was on site. I was allowed to visit the fort. You have to get permission to do that. And the interviews I conducted when I was on site were far superior to the this, this sort of sitting down at the desk interviews with people. It's a very, very different experience being in situ with a participant and, you know, interacting with the space they're talking about. It triggers memories. So I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to go with. I'm definitely going to do that sort of thing. Um, so I borrowed, I borrowed a lot from ethnography here because, it, you know, eth ethnogra ethnographical work is always very much in situ. You know, it's a participant observation type thing. And it does result in a richer data set, I think. Um, in reading about things, and I came across, I borrowed, borrowed another idea from sort of urban, uh, urban geography or, or social geography, where a lot of the work to understand place, which is a, something I'm very interested in, to understand the contract of place, use walking interviews because you're actually interacting with the space. So I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in the city. So that is the methodology I, I chose. And it's, participa it's participatory, it's experiential, and I think it allows for the unexpected. Um, what also was kind of interesting when I was coming up with this and after I had done the first sort of initial um, test run, I thought, oh, this is fun. Okay. Um, I noticed that someone had actually published a monograph. So Chris, um, what I, mean, I believe his name is um, Chris Whitehead, in 2021, published a monograph with some other, with, with, uh, with uh, some collaborators, specifically on using walking um, as, as a sort of methodology to, to understand these social values. I thought, I didn't think to myself, oh, that's a problem, someone else is dying. I thought, I am not like barking up the wrong tree. This actually might work. What I added, and this was not to try and be innovative or anything, this was, this was just something I enjoyed doing, is I, I filmed the interviews. And I think film does another thing. It captures the immediacy of the interaction with place. And it, it, it creates a visual record for you. It's also really practical because it doesn't mean you have, it means, you means you have a fully sort of documented um, viewpoint of what you did um, on those interviews. Um, there's only no to stop, take notes. So it, it adds that. Also, this visual, it, it allows you to have a visual representation of your research. It allows you to share your data in a way that people can engage with, which is quite tricky in our field when there's a lot of numbers or a lot of, if you want to sort of easily transmit it, I can, I can do, I can hopefully do that. And I'm going to give you an example a little later on. The actual meat and bones of it, the methodology, I, it, they were 45 minute long interviews. What I tried to do um, was ask the participants to create their own roof. I didn't, I didn't want them to, to follow any, any of my directions. I avoided the use of any um, words that suggested I was interested in heritage or archeology span or the past. All I said was I was interested in the city and asked them what they were interested in the city. Um, I did suggest we start somewhere and end somewhere because all, all walks need to do that. 
And it ended up with interviews that are really conversational, unstructured, informal. The participants, I started off with the idea of doing 40 interviews. It quickly became real. I realized that that would be totally unmanageable after having done a, um, a, 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 a pilot study. But I would try to recruit them. Um, I started recruiting through social media. The Archaeological Society helped me by sending out a uh, send out as well. And being a resident of the city, I took advantage of this and, and walked out and spoke to people and asked them to join. I did, although this is not uh, 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 this is not a bit of research that is trying to be statistical in any way. I did want to make sure that I tried to capture as many different voices as possible. If I'm suggesting that there should be multiple voices in heritage, I need to make sure that I'm getting those multiple voices. And I did this by categorizing people by their residential status. I spoke to people who don't even live in Valletta. I spoke to people who have just moved to Valletta. I spoke to people like myself who've been there for 10 to 15 years, so I've witnessed that change. And I spoke to people who are born and bred people from people who are multi-generational, il belti, you know. Um, the interview was done in three phases and had to be done around COVID. So that was that was one of the restrictions there. Um, and I'm just going to give you a really quick little video sample. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. There's no audio or anything like that, but it'll give you a sense of what we did. I did try and frame it a little bit so it's actually watchable. There's no audio in this or anything to worry about. It's just to give you a sense of how these interviews were conducted. You might see some familiar faces, yes. Okay, so um, there's also the, the majority of the data is actually textual. It is, it is transcripts of the interviews. And you need to try and filter out that to try and make sense of it. And to do that, I use a, a bit of software called Invivo, which I know some of you are familiar with. It is not the most enjoyable of experiences, but it is a very powerful tool. And I'm not going to go to this in much detail. It's just to show you the kind of things you need to do to be able to try and make sense of this data. And what it allows you to do is to read the data time and time again, tag little elements of those, those interviews, and give, put them in a theme. And as you do that, you keep on refining, and you come through different iterations, and you group them together. And that gives you counts and gives you, allows you access to that data directly. So think of it as just as a sort of fancy set of, of um, uh, spreadsheets with a lot of data attached to it that is easy to use. What are the outcomes? Now, I'm still in the process of writing this up, but I thought I'd give you some of my initial um, findings, if you will. So it is unavoid the, the results are unavoidably by sort of highly biographical and personal. That is a function of the way I ran the, 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 the interviews. People were telling me things about their families, about their lives, about their childhoods, about things they did in the city. So it, it, it is, it's almost sort of like, 20 individual little city biographies. Across the board, there's a common concern with the effects of gen gentrification. I'm sure that is something you probably understand. Interestingly, comments were made to sort of on the, what is acceptable as physical change in the city, what is nice to be restored. They were often contradictory, but you got a, a, a good variety of, of responses. It was very much a localized heritage, um, and it was very much based on everyday places. Um, this, this particular interview that's in the image wanted to start at Bertus, um, which is at the bottom of Merchant Street. Um, and she had her reasons for doing that, because this is something that she considered is the essence of the letter. Um, one of the most poignant and probably the most, the, one of the most interesting themes was the effect on the change of, on the city's community. Um, in general, what, it, what I sort of came to the conclusion, is, and this is pretty obvious, is that social value links people and places in memory with the letter. I'm going to give you a little more kind of detail about that. It is, a, it is a living city, and that is something you need to think about. And thinking back to some of those documents that spoke about livability and, and um, well-being, this is a primary concern, and it is tied into, you know, it tied into the city's heritage as well in terms of how it's lived. The obvious ones, traffic, noise, property prices, and the homogenization of the high streets, you know, Valletta losing its, its, its individuality. At the same time, there were some positives. And these are sometimes contradictory, you know, pedestrianization and traffic, you know, they come at the same time, but 
there are more pedestrianized streets. It allows for a better experience of the city. People were very in favor of the restoration of the historic fabric, the fact that less buildings are abandoned, that it doesn't feel like a war zone in certain areas. And you've got a couple of quotes here, which I'm not going to go over because I don't want to run over time. But my favorite theme, and the one that I think I think I need to explore a little more deeply, is this sort of idea of community. Com not, and this is not community heritage; it is community as heritage. And this, I've used, I've made this, this, um, this, uh, this. I've made changed it for a specific reason. Loss of community is a direct result of the change in city and the prices going up. Of course, it's understandable. It happens in all cities that gentrify. But it's you know to hear it from directly. And to see where places where it's happened and the changes happen is is quite quite meaningful. Um, I highly recommend Peter Reed's Return to Nothing, the meaning of lost places, which 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 is from 1996, because this this talks about the emotional aspects of of communities losing their heritage when cities change or or they move out of cities. This is about place attachment and emotion, and not just nostalgia. This is instances of palpable grief in some of, in some of the in participants. The case in point is this, people from Valletta in the past were more familiar, much closer knit. Today, from my own experience in my own street, I'm the last Maltese Lippia person living there. The person who said this lives in East Street, which is now mostly hotels, if you think about the lower end bit of East Street. It's also about residential neighborhoods. A lot of Valletta's identity comes from its independent little mini quarters in Mandrach, you know, or um, like Chipirku, these places, these places are slowly being eroded. And that is something in, you know, it's, it's about the physicality of it, but it's also about the communities that live there. So it introduced, it gave me this idea, it, it conveyed the sense that the heritage for at least this particular group of people is not about the physicality, it's about the living in the city. It's a community itself that is the heritage. Um, and one of the examples of that is just the characters. These are sort of quasi totemic characters that came to either, um, you know, are either associated with a street or a shop. And there's a really fun example because it tells you about how the characters set a sense of place, a sense of Valletta. And this is, I'm going to read the example out because this is from one of my interviews. There's, there used to be a baker here in the mid 80s, and it used to be like going into a Fellini film. There was this lady with this big red hair who de dealt with everyone. She had these huge gold earrings and a cloud of dust. And this, this person was mentioned quite a few times. And this is something that is disappearing and something that for them made is, is you know, the intrinsic heritage of a letter. Of course, because it was biographical, it was about lived experience and memory. It was about memories of family, about memories of work or studying or social activities. And there was a long list, you know, from from the, the, the bars, which are intrinsically Valletta, Prego, the, the, the ones that are slowly disappearing, Cordinas, which is fortunately still there, and the cultures um, associated with them. This is one of my favorite little quotes from it. This is the thing that gave me that idea. And this is from Charles Bone, um, who runs the Horza restaurant. You might know who he is. Valletta is not made of stone. It's about the individual, the character. I no longer see the people from Valletta that I used to see. And I just thought that really captured the sentiment quite beautifully. Of course, there were other additional themes. I don't have the time to go into them here, but there are some really interesting ones. Sense of place, which I've mentioned before, is not of course not necessarily only associated with the people. It's the streetscapes. It's those familiar buildings. It's the rubinos. It's the it's these these older shops, um, and th these focus fo these featured quite a lot in a lot of the interviews. And this is a, this is um, there's also the, the idea of politics and heritage, which comes up, it, you know, it, it is the center of administration. There is a, a, a heritage, of, a political heritage in the city as well. Um, contested spaces, if you think about how the city um, is now the center of protest, or it always has been, but how, how, how the city now operates with these protests, with barriers being in certain places, and how monuments have taken on new meanings. And this is an example, which I, I find, you know, I, I could write a paper on this on its own. It's, it's a really interesting example of how people attribute totally new meanings and stories to a, a, an existing and quite central heritage monument. And then there are the other Valettas, um, which I don't have really got time to go into right now, but one more interesting ones is the core versus the periphery. I call it the other Valettas because there is another Valetta. There's a Valetta that exists beyond the walls. It is small, it is very localized, it is very much part of Valletta. And here I'm talking about those little boathouse communities that exist on and around. And that is something I need to explore in more detail, but I did find it very interesting that a lot of people pointed out that this is something that needs to be looked after as well. 
So future directions, I'm taking this from two perspectives. One, what I will be doing with this data, possibly. Um, something I will be working on is taking this data and because I have, um, I built a model of the city, which I, which I built on using the uh, planning authorities um, uh, database and, and uh, uh, their map service. And I can plot a lot of this, these responses spatially. Uh, whether or not this is going to tell me anything interesting, we shall see. This is this is my project for the next couple of months. But this this the the the, the image over here is one of my experiments, and this is I plotted out all the routes of where people took me, and you can see the intersections of where people took me. And there are some really in, the green spaces are incredibly popular, but then so are the centre thoroughfares. So I want to see if that's anything you know anything interesting comes out of that. But then. Future, so future directions in a more general level. And I have my closing remarks as well. Um, so if so much of, you know, if, if I, if I, from what I have seen, if so much of heritage significance is embedded in the community and the communal identity, in the social values that people derive from this, surely there must mean, mean that we need to find new ways and approaches to manage the multiplicity of these heritages. That is a historic city or place in our islands possess. Um, some, some work has been done in this. Uh, Dr. Caleri's own work uh, on community heritage, memory and identity is a key example of this. And I know some research has been done in the field of public participation, even in the planning sphere. And I think that is hugely important. I know, I know there was some research done on the well-being of residents in the post V18 Valletta and what, what, um, what worked, what didn't work and what the citizens actually want. How do we take this forward if we accept that this is actually something that is meaningful and that can contribute to people's well-being and to preserve the historic environment by championing other values what is it we can do i think one key way of doing this is through interdisciplinary collaboration if we're not very good at engaging with the public or, or picking up on this maybe we can work with people who are much better than us at doing it um my the original ideas i got i got for this project came from attending artists exhibitions where they discussed Vanishing Valletta, and that was about 15 years ago. It was photographers like David Pisani who were doing these exhibitions, capturing this disappearing, you know, social streetscapes, etc. Maybe we can build better public engagement tools and projects. Mapping is a very good way of doing this, perhaps. Um, I do have a colleague here at York who's done a very good job at using maps to spatialize and visualize using social media, how, how people um, people feel, uh, you know, the social values people attribute to, to spaces. I think one thing we can do is have local listing. And what I mean by local listing here is the ability for local communities, I don't know at what level, either at town level or at region level. And I don't know if this exists in what I don't think it does, um, of putting forward their own spaces, of, 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 of putting forward their own um, spaces, places, buildings, etc., for consideration for scheduling. And that's something that, that then the, the authorities can have a look at and seriously can take into consideration when they're looking at scheduling more properties or areas. And then importantly, I think it is the signing and ratifying of conventions. And I know that this, is, this has been in the, the new cult, uh, arts, um, the, the culture policy document, because I've seen, seen that. And one of their recommendations was that we, as you know, the Maltese government, should ratify or sign all these conventions because it does hold us to be accountable or maybe make, make monies uh, available for projects that might follow in this vein. But on that note, I will end here. Thank you very much. And I guess I should open up for questions. I hope I didn't run for too long. No, it was all right. No, not at all, not at all, uh, Joshua. Well, thank you very, very much for that. Um, uh, extremely thought-provoking thought um, talk. And I think, uh, Given the, I'm having a look now at the list of participants, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who will be wanting to say to say something, and 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 will have questions questions to ask. Um, so I'm just having a look at what is being asked. Um, <laughs> Hugh Grokat, can, can you take us on a walking tour around Valletta sometime, please? <laughs> So I think uh, that's. Uh... I think you. I think we've already done that, Hugh, more than once. <laughs> but I'm, I'm. I'll gladly do it again. Sure. Um, 
Joshua McAuliffe said, out of curiosity with regards to Tinier, did the participants give you any indication of what they'd like to happen with the fort now that it's been restored and, and is, is actually not being used? Joshua, and I, I know where that, that question is coming from. And one of the things they would like, they thought, you know, it's empty. Why not? Why not turn it? Why not turn it into the sort of space where that that is government run and that promotes young bands and gives them free places to practice, to interact? To, to, you know, to train other people. So basically have a sort of new tenure that is, that is actually run there to foster new artists is a lot, is one of the things a lot of them said. Um, the rooms are a little weird, but I mean, it can be done. It was done in the past, but it is a great site for that sort of thing. And I would agree with that. that I think that's a, that's a nice way of doing it. Um, Elena Sherry, have you considered an exhibition there at Tignier based on your uh, MA work? I have actually, and I, I mean, at the moment, I don't even think we could because we, you can't get in. A, a guy with a huge, huge group of keys came and let me in. But it, it, I've considered lots of things like, like actually pursuing, doing more interviews and actually going back to that and and maybe doing a long form version of that. But I, I'd also like to try and capture, you know, at least digitize a lot of the, um, the their archives, the photographs, tie them to the stories. There are also um, tapes in some instances. There was no, there were very few facilities at the time in the 80s. And more, you know, technology's moved on. It's much easier for young musicians to, to, to promote themselves and make their own music nowadays. But they, there were some tapes and they do exist. And I would love to have those digitized. And then maybe sort of like deal, maybe speak to, to Andrew, the two Andrews at Magna's Min and have that, you know, digitized and, and be part of their archive, something that can be shared, something that future projects can come out of. Um, I think it's a very interesting set, a lot of data. And it's such a diverse community as well. Um, a word from uh, Dr. Ruben Grima. Uh, thank you, he says, for a superb lecture. Um, picking up on one thread uh, about the disappearance of iconic characters. This arguably happens in every generation. Do you think we can hope that such figures will be replaced by new ones, even as old ones disappear? I think it depends. It really depends on the... Uh, in, if a letter ceases to be residential and people are just passing through on Airbnb weekends, I do not think they will reappear. If the situation changes and you do get new personalities, I think, yes, surely there will be. Um, of course, there's, there is an element of nostalgia, and I do think new ones will appear. But I, I just, how many new people are actually settling in Veneto that are actually might? I don't know. That's an interesting one, Ruben. I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. But I think it's predicated on the fact whether people can actually settle there and whether the, com the actual communities will form out of the new residents or, you know, new splinter, splinter sort of um, communities form out of what's left. We'll see. I mean, it's early days. The change has only happened in the last 10 years. So we'll see what happens. Um, elective, uh, the so-called elective residents, uh, are, are sometimes even, you know, more enthusiastic about the, the place that they've gone to live in than, than actually the people who've remained behind. So, uh, That's from the true. generation. One of, one of my interviewees pointed that out. He said, he said, look at these, these are all foreigners and they love the city more than the Maltese do. Is, that was his, this, this was this was his comment to me, and I thought, yeah, this is quite interesting. I mean, the first people that I knew moved to Valletta were not Maltese, as in, you know, when it was still prior to the, you know, the, the this 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 you know this period of heavy gentrification. It was it was I you know I met people and said, oh, I live in Valletta now. I'm I'm, I'm an artist from here. Or I'm a young architect or whatever. They they saw potential because they never prejudged the city. Valletta did have somewhat of a you know. A, a reputation. I mean, it's not, it wasn't, I mean, it, it wasn't, I, I don't think it deserved that reputation, but it did have a reputation. It was the kind of place you went to if you did not have a letter to go and shop or to go to court <laughs> or to get your ID card done. Um, you went in, you parked and you left. Um, not everyone, of course, but but it, it, it was in, in general, you know, an out, a total outsider that came in with no preconceived ideas about, about the city that fell in love with it, started, you know, started little bars going into places, started little art events, things happen, and then it just sort of snowballs from there. I mean, that is, that sort of, that sort of, um, I don't know, that sort of gentrification has happened all over. You can just think of the East End of London. It's the same, same set of 
same set of sort of circumstances that 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 fueled that. Well, it certainly happened in Bormla. Yep, yep, yep. It started That's true. off very much with um, people from outside Bormla coming in and and, and being. Uh, I mean, the Bormlese themselves obviously <laughs> loved it very much, but uh, they um, they they sort of gave. Uh, uh, they made people think, look at Bormla in a slightly different way. Um, so, uh, a note from Gillian Asha, do, do you find it difficult to keep your personal opinions out of the discussion when conducting such interviews? I'm it is quite difficult. professional it, about it, that. No, no, it is very, it is difficult. And, and if I do express a personal opinion, I just make sure I note it. I just have to be forthright about me expressing a personal opinion. And this is why I, this is why I position myself as a resident in the first place, because it because I'm not an outsider. I am I am I'm partial insider, a quasi quasi ability. Um, uh, I don't think I'll ever attain proper status, but but I think as long as you recognise that and you recognise what your what your um, your biases may be, and and you you account for that in the text when you're describing things, I think that's okay. But no, it it's it is utterly impossible to separate the two, and. Uh, especially in the kind of work I'm doing, and I don't, I don't even think I want to, to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to have my voice read through the text, and I try to make it very clear that it is my voice that is going through the text. Well, the question here, I was a bit, I was expecting from John Schofield, um, you haven't specifically mentioned Straight Street, although it appeared in the images. How far did Straight Street feature in your in your interviews? Straight Street. Um, so just just in case the straight seat is one of these sort of um it it did feature somewhat people tended to avoid it and they tended to avoid it for two reasons they wanted to avoid it because it has this sort of insalubrious um reputation that that they're like oh you know what it, it's it's not worth walking down it's too busy whatever it has this past but people didn't walk down it it's um I, I don't think I had one interview that walked down Straight Street. We did walk down the part of it, but people did stop and comment on it. And and there was a there was a, a particularly some, I think it depends on what the resident type was. One, if the resident had lived there for a long, long enough time, like myself, they had one set of ideas about whether Straight Street was a successful um or in, uh, an improvement. I would say, if I'm going to be objective, I would say Straight Street is is an improvement on, in in, in that in that it is it is it is true to form. It is a life a, sort of a, a nightlife location, but but other people thought, you know what, this is just not really contributing anything positive. It's just noisy. Um, it just it just makes you know makes it difficult to live here. So it really depends on people's perspectives. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't one of the big flashpoints. It wasn't as big as it saw the market. That was by far the most common. It's almost as if that is the big sort of sticking out red thumb. I was I was quite surprised. Straight Street did not feature that much um, in in the discussions. Apart from people commenting on what other people might think of Straight Street. Uh, one 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 of my interviewees who has a long who's a Valletta born um, but non-resident, but Valletta born and knows Valletta intimately, said that it was just some sort of elitist snobism if people don't like Straight Street now. Um, and I tend to agree with him. I, and, 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 and I mean, I have my, my problems with it, but I have other places to go to, so it's fine. But it was not as much of a stigma. The people who spoke about, there were a lot of people who spoke about it fondly because their families were involved with the old Straight Street. You know, they were musicians, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, it didn't really feature that much. Not as much as I would have expected, to be honest. Um, Rachel Radmili is asking a question about policy making. She says, um, thanks for the inter interesting discussion. Access and heritage roots would be the strand that catches my attention. I like the idea of movement and maps and mapping uh, and the use of spaces. Uh, can, you, can your work contribute to policy making? Nice idea. Well, I... <laughs> And I, it can contribute to lots of, I, I think, depending on, if we take the strand of social well-being, if we take that sort of strand and heritage being a factor in a much larger sort of 
conversation about other things that contribute to well-being, and that would be environmental issues, that sort of thing. Accessibility is another important one. Then heritage can definitely contribute to it. If we have a variety of stories we can tell along a route, it makes it more interesting. So it can, I think it could do. It really depends on you know which which strand we want to have a look at. But certainly yes, and I, I mean roots and that sort of thing, these sort of exploratory ways of engaging with heritage on your own and creating your own stories as you go along, I think is a is a, a fun way of doing things and, and incorporating my kind of work into into you know possibly policy regarding social well-being. I'm trying to avoid tourism because that's not what I want to deal with. That's all we ever deal with. So I want to if it's gonna if it's gonna if it's going to benefit anyone, it should benefit people who live there first and foremost. If it's if it does benefit tourism somehow as a secondary effect, that's fabulous. I hope I answered your question, Richard. <laughs> um, Sarah is uh, asking, did you locate similar scenarios in uh, uh, other countries to compare and contrast your case studies uh, with? Um, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. She says, uh, you mentioned the kind of gentrification that happens, um, has happened in many, many, pl many places. Um, were there other uh, uh, approaches that you took that could be reflected perhaps in other places that you know? The, uh, well, in, on the, well, outside Malta or inside Malta? I mean, inside, the, the, Malta, I think, yeah. inside Malta. Outside Malta. Outside. Well, the gentrification as if, if um, the gentrification studies is not a, a, a heritage thing. It's actually from the realms of sort of urban planning and, and social geography, and there's a lot of work that's been done. So there's a lot of great examples of work looking specifically at places like London and New York. Um, and we're going back to the sort of 50s and 60s. I think the term gentrification is from 1954 or something like that. It's it's The process has been known for a long time and you can probably see early. So yeah, there's... I came at it from by knowing of these other examples and applying it and applying it in the Maltese context. But it, it it wasn't, it's not the planning aspect that I'm interested in. It's it's how we can work maybe heritage into it. But yes, there are so many other examples, um, any of the major cities. But but um I've been reading recently, it's expanded. If you look at this, they've actually got this sort of gentrification has been happening now outside urban zones. It's sort of the gentrification of the small village centers um and that's it spreads the sort of homogenization of culture spreads and it's it's gentrifying you know outside the core outside the metropolis just uh, a, a couple of questions here about the letters um mm -hmm. Felicity Devonshire and ginger little john asking about um uh aspects of the letters heritage do you feel it's under attack i mean as a as a, as a unesco heritage Sorry. Well, well if, it, if we look at if we look at UNESCO, the only thing we need to really worry about is making sure we don't impact the two criterion, right? Which one of them can't really be impacted because it's 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 about this historical link to the night. I guess you could say you erode that link by making too many changes. And the other one has to do with the architectural features, the sort of the 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 Baroque features and, and the style of the city. That is what that is what will impact UNESCO, and that is happening. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I've been following this uh, Mattia Preti case in the last couple of days. Um, I, I think, I, you know, at some point they're going to get fed up with us trying to bend the rules with, with building, you know, building penthouses just off the view. I mean, if you look at Valletta from uh, from another angle, you can see these changes. It's going to impact it, um, but then. Forget UNESCO aside, I think I think some of the sort of the pre-gentrification Valletta needs to be preserved a bit better. Um, I, I I mean I, I have a soft spot for the shop fronts, um, which I, I know are meant to be protected, but I I keep seeing them being being messed with. Um, people had problems with other things like light fittings and so, but there's there's some of that sort of urban fabric needs to be conserved, but not just. It's not just that, right? It's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. If we just look at it from, from the UNESCO perspective, then yes, I mean, it's quite clear cut what we can and what we can't do. Um, but um, as I worked myself into circles, the contrary of what argument I was going to make here. <laughs> but but you yeah, know, so if we're looking at UNESCO, what I'm worrying about, what is what being endangered is that. 
The other aspect I think is endangered is is this the, these these social communities, and I can I don't know if they can be saved because that sort of economic ball is is rolling and is very strong, and as we know the 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 the, the lobbies that run and and conglomerates that do this sort of business are very strong and very politically power, powerful. But at least perhaps we can do exercises in capturing and memorializing those 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 aspects of that are non-material. Um, somebody's asking about the Festa rivalry. Was it was that uh, was that a sort of primary? No, that's really interesting. No. I, it, it did come up. It did come up, and I didn't bring it into this, but I didn't really dwell on it. That 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 would be a really fun. Um, uh, I, if any of you have read J.P. Mitchell, and it's it's it's, it's a great. I mean, it's quite old now, but it's still one of the best best tomes on on the city. Um, yes, that was. It did come up. Carnival is the other one. Carnival and Festa, and these are sort of these these um, community uh, bits of community heritage, which are really important. You know, the Dominicani against the Paulini, that sort of thing. It didn't come up a huge amount because I, I I think people wanted to talk to me more about places rather than about about activities. Or more, it was less about the intangible kind of aspects of art and and um, and and food and that sort of thing, and more about how they remember the city, but you know, I think it'd be it's it's it it is something that deserves its own PhD for sure, or more uh, than one actually. Yeah, probably. Um, uh, Father Eugene Toma is just mentioning so life in life in the eighties as somebody who was you know probably um, singing and playing music at <laughs> at uh, at that time, and uh, he's saying that the youth. Um, did concentrate their time and energy to music and formation of bands and choirs. Um, we rarely discussed politics, but were dedicated to values and issues that related to all of us. Friendship was fundamental. Um, and uh, as an original member of the Voices Choir, we concentrated on the music and drawing attention to social and charitable issues. Um, we practiced practically everywhere running up into the early hours of, of the morning. So he, he obviously remembers that period. It, it, that, that's, that, thank you for that. That's, that's really quite interesting. It means that there's this sort of, maybe, maybe that's how, you know, that age bracket, the sort of late teens to mid twenties handled living in Malta in the eighties is by focusing on things that were positive in their lives. You know, the music, the, the, um, the commonalities as opposed to the differences. And in, 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 when we lived in such a polarized Society, you know, if, if it allowed them that escape, and um, I think that's really interesting. I was just going to mention the the idea of use of space. Mm -hmm. Going back to that original Tinye uh, idea of of just walking in because you could, sort of jumping over yeah. a wall, and, and it was literally easy. that. Um, Today, I don't know where, how possible that that would that would be any more. I mean, not talking about Tini, which obviously Tini, which you obviously can't because it's blocked off mm -hmm. uh, within 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 a strict parameter. Um, but can you just walk into any anywhere now? I think that sort of that ship sailed a bit, really. I think you're probably right. There's very few places that have this sort of. I, I, I mean. I was. I grew up in Malta in the eighties, and there was a lot of abandoned. There were a lot of abandoned places, a lot of mili military infrastructure that was just sitting there, um, which is great for exploration and and you know setting up your forts and that sort of thing. No, that that's that's a that that whole, um, um, you know, sort of. I mean, it's issues of of how much space we do have left is the is the primary concern, and how much of that space is actually usable. <laughs> Um, that feeds into you know conversations about you know how Mizip is used and how you know Rambler's rights and that sort of thing. Most of Malta is inaccessible <laughs> um, or privatized. You know it, it's 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 that has gone. That is very true. Mammal Island use was part of that broader sort of spectrum of abandonment. I don't know if you remember the kind of rumors that used to go on about Mammal Island and and all the sort of dark nefarious things that used to happen, and we were all terrified of it, but. It was a great, great for storytelling when we were young. I, I, I do miss it. It was, I love that. 
I'm just just a, a, a last comment because I think we'd better stop the recording very soon. Um, amongst the issues that you mentioned, were, was was it were these comments generalised over the whole of Valletta, or were there specific issues? Um, I don't know if you were no, it, it is it is quite. It, it, there is a there is there are so I spoke I only presented the kind of themes in general, but there were certain places which were always singled out, certain things that people found, you know, were very disappointing. I, I, I mean, I mentioned this, and it, I have no personal problem with saying it, but the thing that popped up the most was how disappointing the sort was, how taking, taking, taking a market, which was actually run by people who are community members, um, and just turning it into, into a commercial enterprise, and, and failing to, 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 um, live up to the promises of actually having public space where art in front, where there was some, meant to be some sort of public art venues in, in front. People really disliked that, 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 that shopping part of life. And what, something I learned that I didn't realize is that some of the people who had little stalls there were relocated within Valletta. And people still, people who shopped now just don't, they don't go to the store, they go to the same storekeeper wherever they are relocated in Valletta. And I didn't, I didn't know that until I did these interviews. You, you discover things, you know, from, from people who are in the know or have different sort of levels of understanding of the city to yourself through that. So in certain places were always singled out. People would all, you know, there's, it's those heritage flashpoints again. Things that would pop up would be, would be whether or not you like what Ren Soprano has done at the city gate, uh, whether or not you like the fact that Castile looks like it is brand new, whether or not you like... Um, how many, you know, um, standard European shops now characterize our high streets, whether or not you, it, it, it goes, there were loads and very specific examples. The themes are the same, but the examples are different. And that's when I was saying I want to kind of map this eventually. Uh, I'm assuming that the data allows for it. I might be able to do some of that like that. You do have some specific kind of spatial values or qualities to that information. Well, I think we're going to have to come to a c close at this point, Joshua. Um, to everybody, thank you very much for participating in this evening's event. We look forward to seeing you again next time when Mr. Matthew A. Grima, Manager of the Diagnostic Science Laboratories, uh, DSL at uh, Heritage Malta, will give us a talk entitled Secrets Unraveled, Science Applied to Archaeology. That'll be on Wednesday, 14th December, at the usual time of 6 p.m. If any of you are interested in joining the ASM, please visit our website and you'll be supporting the Society in its uh, lecture program, the peer-reviewed journal, the MAR, and also in its advocacy work in support of all things archaeological in Malta. Uh, sincere thanks from the Archaeological Society of Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University to Joshua Zajorajo for his talk tonight, which I'm sure you will agree has raised some very, very interesting questions.